You're hanging out After Hours with Matt Anderson, presented by Inside the Gamecocks. Good evening, everybody. Welcome in to the Late Night Gamecock Show. It is 9.05 on March 18th, 2024, and we are talking about the Gamecock men's basketball team being in the NCAA tournament. Uh, for me, you know, I'm 35 years old. This is the third time or fourth time in my life this has happened. So it's it's definitely exciting. It's definitely something that we should all celebrate because this is not something that happens every single season for the Gamecocks. But with Lamont Paris and the turnaround the Gamecocks had from year one to year two, I think that the Gamecocks have every opportunity to be dancing more often than not. And at this point, you know, the Gamecocks are somewhat still of a Cinderella. I look at the Gamecocks and I think about their strength of record, their KPI, the fact that the Gamecocks are, you know, top 20 in both of those statistics, but yet the Gamecocks are still a number six seed. I have a lot of thoughts on that. I, I don't necessarily think that it was, a fair seed, especially when you see like St. Mary's and Gonzaga as a five seed. I, I do think that the Gamecocks, and if, if you're on the big spur.com, if you're on anywhere that I'm active on social media, but mostly it's the big spur.com and, and it's this show right now. I thought the Gamecocks had an opportunity for a four seed. I thought it could have been a five seed. Uh, the, the six seed was kind of the floor. I thought that was the floor for the Gamecocks. And and knowing that the Gamecocks, I think if, if the selection committee was accurate in what they said and not just kind of, you know, whistleblowing as they got through their, their long, long grind of making a bracket, I believe the Gamecocks were the last six seed, which I, I, I kind of have a problem with. I don't think they should have been the last six seed. I thought they should have been a five seed. But on the... On the flip side of that, I've also said that I thought that a six seed was the best opportunity for the Gamecocks in this particular season to find their way into a Sweet 16 or an Elite Eight. I, I do think that Houston, Purdue, and obviously Connecticut are the best teams in the country. And if you were a four or five seed, it was going to be tough slogging to get through it. But we're going to talk all about the bracket tonight. Um, I think that overall the Gamecocks ended up with a six and five record in quad one. They had an 11 and five record in quad one and quad two. I think the two quadrant three losses hurt them. I, th I think that it's kind of silly that the two quad three losses hurt them the way that they did because you have two quad three losses by a combined six points. And look, Maybe because both of them were at home, that that's why the Gamecocks kind of got dinged. But you're talking about six points combined for your two quad three losses. And you're talking about four possessions over those two games going the other way. And then all of a sudden the Gamecocks are 13 and five in quad one and quad two instead of 11 and five. So I got a lot of thoughts on it. I, um, I will continue to give my thoughts, you know, probably throughout this show. But I think what actually hurt the Gamecocks more than anything else was the non-conference strength of schedule. Uh, if you look at any of the predominant non-conference strength of, strength of schedule um, rating systems, the Gamecocks finished at 336 out of 362 Division One teams. And uh, that's that's tough for the Gamecocks. Because when you schedule Clemson, Virginia Tech, and you schedule Notre Dame, like that is a full SEC schedule, and it's three ACC schools, and it's a, a, a neutral site tournament out in Arizona where you beat Grand Canyon, who, you know, check my math, only lost like four games this year, one of those to the Gamecocks. So, I don't know what the what the selection committee is going to do with non-conference strength of schedule. I think at the end of the day, if you have a KPI and you have a strength of record that's as high as the Gamecocks were, then you really, really need to reevaluate how you're sorting through all of this data. I, I I don't know how you can have the record you have in quad one and quad two and 
and still be a six seed with the KPI and strength of record. But anyway, uh, I can talk about that all day. What I'd like to do right now is bring in our guest tonight. Our guest tonight is um, Mitchell Dieter, and he is a, a, a good friend of mine that's also um, watched way more college basketball <laughs> than I have this year. Mitch, how you doing? I'm doing good. How about you, Matt? Man, um, I was just telling our producer, Phil, that one of my favorite things that I do every year, and it, it, it used to be every year, Mitch, it's not every year anymore, but we have our kind of fantasy football style NCAA tournament player pick them. And that was a lot of fun. And we have five or six guys that do it. But so, Mitch, just off the cuff here, what, what's your take on where South Carolina was seated? Yeah, listening to the intro there, it is funny. I, I would almost tell South Carolina fans get in line with the gripes with the committee. Uh, <laughs> it sounded like there was probably a lot of them uh, across pretty much every conference and and whoever you're a fan of this year. Uh, but but I think the the most interesting thing when you look at the seed that that South Carolina got in the sixth seed was really the discrepancy of the eleven seeds across the board. Like, what what are the differences? I think in if you look at net ranking between the highest 11 seed in New Mexico and then Duquesne, I think there's like a like an 85 uh, or like a 65 yeah. uh, spread in the net ranking. So, you know, I, I know it's tough. They they try and filter it out. I, I do think it it is a bit low uh, for for this the spot that they got. But I actually don't hate the draw that the Gamecocks got. Uh, you know. I'm sure you'll make it known to to the viewers here in a little bit. Uh, I, I am not a Gamecock fan. I'm actually the opposite of that. But I, I consider myself a pretty rational person when it comes to talking college basketball. Yeah, absolutely. We're we're taking a break here in a second. Maybe Mitchell are actually gonna or Mitch Mitchell, whatever we're gonna call you tonight. But um, but most of the time, like you know, me and Mitch kind of cross swords when it comes to college basketball and our thoughts on it. So it'll be fun to to pick pick the bracket tonight. And it should be a good time. But yeah, so Mitch is actually um, a guy that played college basketball um, four years, played in the NIT. He watches this stuff more than I do. I'm, I'm really jealous that you're in Texas because in Texas, you get a little bit of a time difference. So I'm really going to lean on you when it comes to the Mountain West Conference and, you know, even the Pac-12, the Pac Pac-10. They're not even a conference anymore. <laughs> I think this is the last year. But um, let's go ahead and fill. Let's let's hit a break, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up um, a NCAA tournament ESPN bracket challenge, and me and Mitch will go through it. And I think you have um, all the images we need. So let's hit a break, and we'll be right back. Don't miss this, the final taping of season one of the Southern Songwriter Series with Patrick Davis is Friday, March 22nd in the Chappelle Auditorium at Allen University in Columbia. Patrick will be joined by renowned national artists and songwriters David Ryan Harris, Sean Mullins, and Drew Holcomb in this national made-for-TV event that will be broadcast on over 300 stations in the U.S. this summer. Tickets are available at southernsongwriters.com. VIP and general admission seats are available, but are moving quickly. Go see one of South Carolina's proudest musical sons, Patrick Davis, alongside a national cast of elite performers. Visit southernsongwriters.com. That's southernsongwriters.com. The Southern Songwriters Series with Patrick Davis, Friday, March 22nd at Allen University in Columbia. Tartan Day South, built by Culpepper Wood, is the largest Tartan Day celebration in the Southeast. Friday, April the 5th, three great Celtic rock bands perform at the Lexington Amphitheater. Saturday, April 6th, it's the main event at the historic Columbia Speedway in Casey. Featuring Highland Games, Celtic dance, music, and food. Featuring exhibits like Sheepdog Herding, Birds of Prey, and classic British cars at the largest Tartan Day celebration in the Southeast. Get your tickets now at TartanDaySouth.com.
So bracket season is amazing. Everybody has brackets all around the country. I used to do like 50 brackets a year. I'd find every free challenge and I've only won one bracket challenge in my entire life. And it was the year that Kansas and Mario Chalmers hit a three pointer to send a game into overtime against Memphis. And I think me and my buddy split it. We won $900 a piece. So that was super fun. But we have a bracket challenge for you, which I encourage everybody to be a part of. Um, make sure you download the Chief Sports Network app. And I don't have all the details as of right now, but I know there's going to be some cool prizes. Um, if you listen inside the Gamecocks earlier today, I'm sure that, that you will hear all about it. And make sure that you have your bracket locked in Thursday. Mitch, the first game start, what, about 1145, 1140? I think 1210 Eastern's first tip, uh, and then it gets going pretty rapidly after that. Uh, <laughs> rapidly is the right word there. But, yeah, so make sure you get into that Chief Sports Network bracket challenge. I'm going to be a part of it. I know that JB, JC, and Phil will be a part of it. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I see here that it looks like Craig. Craig, you picked Auburn to win it all in the ITG bracket? Come on now, man. Like, just because they beat the Gamecocks by – 71 points over two games doesn't mean they're the best team in the country, but but I, I do like that pick. And um, w, WJM41, just just glad to be playing in the tournament finally. Absolutely. Craig also made a joke about the pack two. Yeah, it's the pack two now. It's it's a it's a tough, tough sledding for all of those folks. Um, again, I would kind of ignore the stuff in here where people are saying if you type this in, you're gonna get an iPhone. 18 or something let's not do that um but yeah craig i do agree with you auburn is pretty daggum deep they're they're obviously they're a pretty good team because they beat the gamecocks but all right so mitch if you're ready i kind of want to pick this bracket with you um yeah, Phil, i think we should save the midwest region for last because that's where the gamecocks are we will get to the gamecocks in a bit but let's go ahead and start with the east region uh connecticut the number one team in the country for my money the entire season. Uh, they start out with Stetson. Mitch, I don't know if you're going to pick an upset here. It happened to uh, Purdue last year. It did, and that was as shocking as it might come, even <laughs> with Purdue's recent uh, mishaps. But, uh, no, I, I think UConn uh, handles Stetson, even though cool story for Stetson, uh, first time ever in the tournament. Yeah, so – Good, good on you, Stetson. Um, hopefully, we'll see you again next year. Hopefully, not as a 16 seed playing against the defending national champion. But Stetson, it, it should be fun. I'm, I'm really glad, Mitch, in these kind of situations that the first time you're ever in the tournament, you're not in a playing game. I think yeah. that the selection committee should always do that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It, it, there's there's two schools of thought with that. Like these these lower level schools. Uh, granted, I, you know, I went to one. We never made the tournament. It is pretty cool to boast that you won an NCAA tournament game if you play in that playing game. But I agree, as an AQ, you should you should get to play on Thursday or Friday. I uh, get to play a one seed, get the whole uh, experience. So I, I agree with that. Absolutely. And the next game here on the bracket is kind of interesting because you have Florida Atlantic, Final Four team last year returned all of their players, um, found ways to lose to Q4 and Q3 teams this year a couple times. And then you have Northwestern, who just won their first NCAA tournament game under Chris Collins a couple years ago. So, you know, Mitch, I'll, I'm going to go first here, and I want to get your take on this. Sure. I'm going to go Northwestern. I think that Florida Atlantic is just – I mean, they just lost to Temple. What do you want me to say? <laughs> It's it is a fair point. My concern with Northwestern is is their depth. You know they they have two season ending injuries for you know Ty Berry was a guy that that was really playing well for them. And then you know the thing about Florida Atlantic and it it's it's one of these things. I'll probably bring it up with these eight nine games on paper. They almost always look good, but for whatever reason, when you're in the middle of a Thursday Friday, you look up and the eight nine games are like the only blowouts that are on the <laughs> that are on your screens yeah, at the time. Absolutely, um, but. I I probably lean Florida Atlantic on this. I just I like their guard play. I like their depth. Um, and and it's less of an indictment on Northwestern and more on their, you know, their their depth issues with their injuries. But you know, Boo Booey will be the best player on the court. And in, when Absolutely. it comes to tournament, when it comes to tournament time, it's tough to bet against that when a guard 
uh, for your team as the best player on, on the court. So this is a really a coin flip game for me. Um, as it was last year for FAU, it, it took a miracle uh, for them to to beat Memphis on a on a pretty con- controversial call. So uh, that they they know this game very well. And last year, I was all over Memphis. Every bracket, every bracket was Memphis. You know what, man? I'm going to I'm gonna do the coin flip here, and I'm going to say Northwestern as our official pick here, unless you have Perfect. a huge gripe. I don't have a gripe with that at all. All right, so and, we, we got – go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, so we got UConn, we got Northwestern. We're going to keep going through this first round on the East Bracket. Uh, San Diego State, UAB. I've seen UAB as a trendy upset pick so far, but I don't see it. Yeah, you know, every 12-5 is going to be trendy to some degree. Um, it's actually fizzled off a little bit more the last couple of years when you think about it. Uh, there haven't, there, I don't think there was a single 12-5 last year, uh, maybe only one the year before. Uh, there's been some larger ones as we've seen, but uh, this would not be if you if you kind of have a rule to pick one twelve five uh, in your bracket. This would not be the one I take. San Diego State. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, being here in Texas, I do a lot, watch a lot of the Mountain West. Yeah. It's it's a great conference. Uh, they are they're going to beat you up, and uh, you know we saw it last year in their Final Four run. But I, I don't I don't see UAB, even though they they have some good guards. They're a decent team, but I don't see it. Well, it's funny that you have FAU and San Diego State in this kind of top little, you know, eighteen quadrant, and they're all, you know, in the same area. So, you know, what's going to happen? Well, I guess three. You have three of them because you have yep. UConn, you have FAU, and you have San Diego State. I'm I'm going to push through San Diego State here. I think that's the right move. But, um, you know, you never know what happens when these five twelve games. It's weird because. The five twelve games, everyone says is an upset, but the six eleven game is actually more of an upset. Um, the yeah. sixes usually go further if they win, but uh, the five twelve game is interesting. Auburn Yale, this is one that I've seen people get a little trendy with, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. If we have to say much about this. <laughs> I don't think I don't think Auburn's going to lose to Yale. All right. It'd be one of those things where, you know, Auburn would have to play terrible. And given Auburn has put out some dud performances this year, I, but, you know, I, I think Bruce Pearl will, will have them ready. At, you know, Yale, you know, Johnson's a great coach there, been there for forever, like one of the, you know, most winning coaches in the Ivy League history. Uh, Yale wasn't even the best team in the Ivy League this year. Uh, Princeton was. They lost to Brown uh, in the yeah. the semifinals. So uh, Yale has a, a decent team, watched a little bit of them. Uh, you know, throughout the end of the year, but I, Auburn's far too talented to lose this game. <laughs> and, and too deep as well. Yep. Uh, so you got BYU, Duquesne. I'm going to go BYU here. I don't think this is going to be an upset. BYU is a really, really good offensive team. They can shoot the crap out of the basketball and they're not having to play on a Sunday. So they will be <laughs> ready for Saturday. Yep. Uh, Illinois, Phil, I'm uh, no, not Phil. Um, Mitch is actually wearing a Chicago, Chicago land shirt. So, um, so Mitch's dad is a big Illini fan. Do you think that Moorhead state finds a way to upset the big 10 conference champion? I, uh, I, again, I don't see it. I, I'm fairly chalk in the, in the, in the East region here. I think there's the, it's, it's top heavy, uh, for sure. And, and a lot of the lower seeds, I don't, I don't necessarily love again. The Duquesne is way overseeded as an 11, BYU, you mentioned it was supposed to be a five seed, but they couldn't play on Sunday, so they're a six seed. Um, I, Illinois is too good. Terrence Shannon Jr., Marcus Damask, I don't, I don't see Moorhead State having any answers for them. Yeah, I'm right there with you. And the same thing, you know, as we get further down this bracket, we're going to have the same conversation. We're not always going to do the in-depth analysis here, but, you know, one of the games that I kind of have circled is this next one, mm-hmm. Washington State versus Drake. Washington State is a team like South Carolina that did not have a lot of preseason expectations. They've they punched above their weight class and beaten Arizona twice, but I feel like the sky is falling down on them right now. And I think that Drake is just too talented and that they've been here before. Yeah, I, this is is probably one of my favorite first round games in the entire tournament, uh, just because of what you mentioned, like Washington state's kind of coming out of nowhere, their first tournament in a, in a while. Um, you know, Kyle I think Smith since did a Tony great, Bennett, 
Yeah. yeah. Kyle Smith did a great job with them. Uh, you know, probably a team that doesn't have a lot of hype because not too many people sit out there and watch the Pac-12 network. And I don't really even think anyone can watch the Pac-12 network. You can't get it. it. Uh, <laughs> and, and the interesting thing about Drake is, uh, you know, really good team. We're there last year. We're a super trendy uh, upset pick to beat Miami last year. I think they were even like, it was a pick them. They might have been even favored. Uh, their best player, coach's son, Tucker DeVries, went one for 13 in that game, scored scored three points. He's a perennial 20 point a game scorer. I think they sort of have a chip on their shoulder. They had the dramatic win over Indiana State, who was everyone was trying to hope for it was a you know attorney darling. I think Drake's a really good team. I love this game. Uh, I, I would probably lean Drake here. Uh, I think they're super experienced. Uh, and I think Tucker DeVries comes out uh, really trying to avenge his three point performance against Miami last year. I'm right there with you. I'm going to go ahead and say that Mitch and I agree it's going to be Drake. The next game here, Iowa State, South Dakota State. Um, a couple of years ago, South Dakota State had a phenomenal six foot ten big guy that was scoring 30 points a game. They don't have him this year. I think Iowa State was probably one of the more criminally robbed teams <laughs> in the NCAA tournament to get a two seed. And not only that, the last two seed. And I know North Carolina, you win the ACC, there's tradition there. And look, winning the ACC is a, is a big deal. Uh, NC State had a magical run, and we'll talk about them later on in the bracket. But I think Iowa State defensively is just going to be too much for South Dakota State. Uh, I don't think you're going to see this one as a trendy upset pick. I, yeah, completely agree. And I mean, really, the only thing you need to say is Iowa State just beat Houston by 30, so... <laughs> <laughs> and Houston might be the best defensive team I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, so let's let's keep going here. Let's find some sweet 16 teams in the East bracket. Uh, you have UConn Northwestern is what we have picked. Mm -hmm. uh, I I like Northwestern. Uh, I hope that they can win some games. It'd be fun to see them go on a run. Chris Collins is the first coach to ever win an NCAA tournament game at Northwestern. I still remember him putting his arms in the air after after that win a couple of years ago, but I think UConn's just too talented. Yeah, this would be a game that, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me to be close at half, and then UConn just kind of steps on the gas and, and squeezes them out to, you know, win by 15 or something like that. Yeah, I was about to say, I think UConn by 20 in that one <laughs> over the long term. Yep. Now, San Diego State-Auburn would be really interesting. That's the next game we have up here. Auburn likes to push the tempo. San Diego State uh, traditionally has not. But, Mitch, you know more about San Diego State than I do. Yeah, over under like 60 fouls in this game probably. Uh, <laughs> I, this yeah. would be an absolute rock fight. And and really it, it is whatever team can control the pace. San Diego State, while they're not as conservative as a, you know, or Virginia is, I don't think anyone in the world is, uh, they, they definitely don't push it up and down. But they don't mind playing, you know, there's a couple of Mountain West teams that get up and run and they they've done a good job of controlling pace. I mean, we saw it time and time again in the tournament. You know, they they beat an Alabama team last year that, uh, again, was you know one of the best, uh, you know, outpaces almost anyone in the country. Um, but, yeah, that's uh, I, I probably lean Auburn here. I think they're more talented uh, if they can kind of get out and control the pace. I, I would. I would think they beat San Diego State. Well, it's it's interesting with Auburn, and I'm I'm not going to belabor this point too long, but you know they are deep, as we've mentioned already. But at the same time, Auburn has been a computer metric darling, mm -hmm. and they have consistently stayed in the top ten, top fifteen. Now they're a top five team in the country. I think that you know get, hitting their run in the SEC tournament is going to be enough for them to to make a good run in the NCAA tournament. I, I don't know how far we're going to take them, but I, I do think they get past San Diego State. Um, the, only, the only quip I have with that is San Diego State-UConn as a, as a tourney, as a national championship rematch in the Sweet 16 is something that the storylines would love, but I, I, I would think Auburn gets there. Yeah, you need Tim Tim Donahue refereeing <laughs> that game to make that storyline happen. I think, but I think there's a, you know, a couple of college basketball refs that that are on that path. <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, just find the Temple referees. That's all we're looking <laughs> for. Um, yeah. So the next one, BYU Illinois. This one's actually really interesting to me. BYU is a six seed. Illinois is a three seed. I think that 
BYU has the offensive ability to score with Illinois. I, I wonder if Illinois' defense is going to be too much because Illinois can score with anybody. I mean, that, that's proven. But can is this going to be the, the sixth seed that gets to the Sweet 16 early? I don't know. I mean, you watch Illinois not a lot. What do you think, Mitch? Yeah, I watch both these teams a lot. I like I like how they play. It, the thing that scares me about BYU and that scares me about a lot of teams is if if they start missing shots, it goes downhill and it goes downhill fast. Where Illinois can score at all levels, and and one of the things I always lean towards when it's it's sort of a toss up matchup, and we talked about this in the Northwestern game is who's the best player on the floor, and it's Terrence Shannon Jr. and it's really not even close. Um, and he just proved this in the Big Ten tournament. He can he he can take over games. I think he scored like a hundred points in the Big Ten tournament. So I would lean towards Illinois here. Uh, I'm open for discussion, but I think it's just the variance from BYU and how they shoot it. If they get down, I think Illinois can can withstand that um, better than BYU can. Yeah, I mean, one of the and I agree with everything you just said. I would have loved to have seen Illinois Purdue in the in the big 10 final we didn't get it but i I do lean illinois here uh drake iowa state is the the other game we have here in the east bracket i I think iowa state is too proven on the defensive end i i think this is you know it's weird i i feel like iowa state has a pretty good run to get to the sweet 16 i don't i don't think that any of the teams they face is going to give them you know washington state drake or south dakota state i don't know yeah, I, I agree. I don't see it either. I think Iowa State, uh, as long as they – and they can do it, you know, multitude of ways. So, I think they get to the Sweet 16. So, now we have to find a way to decipher through UConn and Auburn. I mean, you have two top five teams in the computer metrics. Uh, UConn, you say what you want about them. I think that they are one of the best teams I've seen all season long. They're the defending national champions, but you're going to run up against an Auburn team that is high and all the computer metrics are deep, have, have the depth that we've talked about. This is the one where I think that everyone making a bracket has to make a decision. Yeah. I, I don't disagree with you. I am just shocker. I mean, I know they're the number one overall uh, seed or, I just I think they're too good. I think UConn is too good. They don't really have any like place where you point at them and you say that's where you can beat them. I mean, you look at their losses this year. I mean, if you shoot seventy five percent and make fifteen threes, like that's the recipe on your home floor. Like <laughs> that's the recipe yeah. to beat to beat UConn, and and they're not going to have that. Um, I, I just like. I like UConn one through eight better than I like Auburn one through eight. Um, but I, I do think this would be an awesome, a really fun game, especially in the sweet 16. Yeah. I think Auburn f- f- it sticks around for a little bit, but at the same time, Auburn has only three quad one wins this entire season. And most of those, or I think one of them are at home and then two of them are in a neutral site. UConn's just too good. I'm, I'm going to push UConn through. All right, so now you got Illinois versus Iowa State. And in my mind, I think this is where Iowa State finds a way to get it done. I don't know how, but they what they did against Houston was so impressive to me. But I don't know if you can carry that forward. So this is a coin flip game. That is the only thing. I And it, I, this might just be a blind spot for me. I, I, I know Iowa State is good. I, I just don't really know how, right? Like they don't have, <laughs> yeah. they don't have the star power. You would think of a team. Like if you, if you go through like the top 10 teams in the country, you can automatically name the top player on that team. And there's a very good chance that they're going to be playing in the NBA outside of maybe a big guy. I don't there. know who I would, who I would say Iowa State's best player is. It just seems like six players hit threes and they have yep. seven players on defense every possession. Yep. I, I agree. And it and then like you go to a coaching matchup. I, I think Underwood and Osselberger are both awesome coaches. I think they'll have, you know, with time to prepare, they would both have their their teams ready to go. Iowa yeah. State didn't play a single team in the non con. Um they, they, know, everything, they had a worse non con than South Carolina did. So that's like the only thing that worries me is and it's 
uh, they didn't lose a game at home. It's an impossible place to play. Um, so that's the thing that worries me the most. I said it for the last game with Illinois too. Terrence Shannon Jr. will and Marcus Damask will probably be the two best players on the court and they play for Illinois. Um, but you said it. Iowa State has seven guys on defense, it feels like, every time they play. So if they can control the pace and force Illinois' role players to try and make plays, I can see them winning. I I like Illinois personally in this, but I'm I'm not going to say Iowa yeah, State's I a mean, bad pick. I, I, I will say this. I'm going to take Illinois here because I think I kind of agree with everything you just said. I don't know what it is about Iowa State. They just find a way, but I think that finding a way through the Big 12 conference tournament and then finding a way against Illinois can be a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and, I, and honestly, I don't think it matters if you're filling out your bracket at home because I think UConn's going to the Final Four. I think yep. UConn's going to beat Illinois. So we got one Final Four team, if you agree with me. <laughs> I agree. Yeah, I, I like UConn out of the East. All right, so we're going to go straight down here, Phil, to the West. Um, the West is it's, – it's an interesting bracket for a lot of reasons. <laughs> um you know, obviously, South Carolina fans are going to pay attention to Clemson being in this in this region, but you know, and we'll talk about game by game. But let's just move North Carolina ahead of of was it Wagner, Howard Wagner, Howard, I don't Howard know. Wagner, yeah. yeah. Okay, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you just move, yeah, you move them forward. Yeah. Uh, Mississippi State, Michigan State is interesting because both of these teams perform very well in the computer metrics. Um, I did, I did not think Michigan state deserved a nine seed and I didn't know if they deserved to get into the, into the NCAA tournament, just being quite honest. I thought Mississippi state won their way through their sec tournament run, um, into the tournament, but this is the, one of the most difficult games to predict, but I, I think I'm going to go with the team that I think has been the better team throughout the season and the harder conference and go Mississippi state over Michigan state. I agree. Uh, both these teams in my eye test don't pass it. I, I don't really like either one of these teams in the way they play. Uh, yeah. Mississippi State, I agree with you as a better team. Uh, the only drawback is Michigan State has that coach. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, has that won guy. Many times. <laughs> yeah, that, that one guy that's won in March many a time. So I, I, I don't think Michigan State's very good this year. I think we saw that from the opening weekend of the season, even though JMU turned out to be a good team. Uh, Michigan pretty, State, pretty daggum good. <laughs> yeah. I, I just I I think Michigan and Mississippi State can win that game. Yeah, I'm a, I'm gonna push Mississippi State through, not because this is a South Carolina show and we like the SEC. I just <laughs> think that 14 losses on the season say something about you. And you know, Mississippi State is a rugged tough team that can also get hot from three. Yep. And I, I just don't know if I, I, I mean, I have a whole conspiracy theory, by the way, that Michigan state and Gonzaga getting the seed lines they got was you have Tom Izzo and you have Mark few, yep. like that's why you are where you are. I mean, I can't fathom it. We'll, we'll talk about this next team in a second, but St. Mary's and Gonzaga both getting a five seed. Like, I have never seen more respect for the West West Coast Conference in my entire life, and I don't know why. St. Mary's is has been dead to me since like the opening week of the season when they <laughs> when they blew a fifteen point lead to Portland State at home. So and and this is another theme of of teams that and I this is a bias of me is I cannot stand the style of basketball that they play. It is an absolute grind to watch St. Mary's basketball games. They shoot the ball with five seconds left on the shot clock. They foul you every possession down the court and force the refs to call it. Sounds like South Carolina. (laughs) A little bit. This is it. This is this is St. Mary's is is Tennessee last year before they had Dalton connect Virginia. They play that same style, which is interesting enough. Why, if you do want to pick a 12-5, I am going to have no qualms about picking Grand Canyon to beat St. Mary's. Grand Canyon is awesome. They are loaded with uh, P- P6 transfers. Uh, they got Bryce Drew as the coach. He's been there before. I I love this Grand Canyon team. They play with a ton of swagger, and I think that's a team that can beat St. Mary's. So if we want yeah. to do it here, I'm okay with that. But 
it's more of my bias against how much I, I don't really want to see St. Mary's play two games in the tournament. <laughs> so, yeah. So by the way, um, anytime I reference somebody sweating over under, it's this guy right here. Um, we have a, we have a really fun group chat where we talk about literally almost every college basketball game in existence. I mean, I think Mitchell has been sweating, you know, big South games recently, but yeah. But anyway, yeah, I, I, I'm going to pick Grand Canyon here too. I don't think I've seen anything from St. Mary's this entire season that tells me they are better than, let's face it, another mid-major mm -hmm. who has probably played a better schedule than than St. Mary's had and has won more games. So, yeah, we'll push Grand Canyon here. Um, Alabama Charleston, uh, you know, so Mitch played college basketball at Charleston Southern. He has uh, – familiarity with college of Charleston. He got recruited by them and different coach now, but Alabama Charleston is one of those games. That I think it's going to be a frenetic pace. I just think that Alabama is way better on offense. Yeah. It's funny. I, you know, whatever the over is in this game, take it. Uh, this game will probably be played in like the one eighties uh, at some point, but uh, you know, it's, this is the worst matchup for Charleston uh, of of really anyone else on the four line. Yeah, uh, because Alabama does what Charleston does. Alabama just does it way better than them, and yeah. with way better players. So I agree. Um, if Charleston was you know playing another four like a like a Kansas or you know a Duke, I would I would seriously consider taking them. Uh, but I just don't think they have the the horses to get past Alabama. Yeah, and um, so we got a comment in here, Mitch. Uh, Trent says, give us a lock, Mitch Cedar. We, we will find a lock here a little bit. We haven't talked about Vegas over-unders and point spreads. And you know what? I might have to get Mitch on here another time this week, and we can do some, some of that. But uh, the next one here, Mitch, we got Clemson versus New Mexico. And as we mentioned at the start of the show, you know, Mitchell does have a fondness for Clemson. I don't know why he's from <laughs> Chicago. I, I, I don't, I, we're not going to get into the reasons because I don't really understand them, but Clemson, New Mexico is a really interesting matchup because I don't feel like Clemson outside of their wins against South Carolina. And then later on in the season against North Carolina deserved a six seed. And yeah, I have a, a big, Thing in my head too that like head-to-head -to -head matters and maybe South Carolina didn't deserve a six seed but New Mexico is one of those teams that I don't know if you heard this Mitch but the selection committee said that they were a bid thief they were not going to be in the NCAA tournament which is bonkers to me <laughs> wildly surprising um, yeah. <laughs> so to, to your point I, again I, I mentioned this at the top that you know the the eleven the variance of 11s is crazy. New Mexico, I believe, is like twenty two in the net. They're favored in this game against Clemson, so picking this as an upset wouldn't actually be an upset. Uh, yeah. I you you said it. I am a Clemson fan. I do not think Clemson is well coached. I don't think they have a very good coach. <laughs> uh, I think they have squandered a, a very talented at least top six or seven players that they have. PJ Hall is fantastic. Um, this is. This is an interesting game, and I think this is this will be a really good game um, stylistically. I have no problems picking New Mexico here. Again, they're they're favored by like two and a half points. It's not even a pick them. Uh, so I see Clemson either either losing this game by like 10 points, 10, 15 points in New Mexico or making the Sweet 16. Um, if they lose, hopefully that means there's a, uh, a new coach uh, in the upstate. Uh, but <laughs> That's uh, that's where I'll leave this. I will let you pick this one. <laughs> well, it's actually funny. Um, I got a text a little while ago that, and and this was not about Clemson at all. Um, this was um, a friend that sent this. There have been eleven instances where the eleven seed has been favored over the six. Those eleven seeds are ten and one straight up, and nine have won by double digits, which, you know. Throw everything that I've said all, you know, NCAA tournament bracket season about how I wanted the Gamecocks to be a six seed. Uh, right now, I think the Gamecocks are favored, but we'll get to their game towards the end. But, you know, for the sake of this show, Mitch, we're going to have to pick New Mexico here. But Perfect. I agree with you. Um, I, I think Clemson has really good players. They have, you know, PJ Hall and they have that other tall, curly haired guy that 
just seems to play harder than anybody else. He's like the yeah. last person you want to see him pick up because you just know that he's going to get every rebound, every dunk, everything. But we're going to take New Mexico for this show and um, take that how y'all want to take it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the next one, Baylor Colgate. Um, I think that what we've seen lately are more 14s, 15s, and crazy enough, 16s finding a way to win. I, I, I don't think that it happens in Baylor Colgate. I think Baylor's too good. So we're going to go and push them across here. Uh, Dayton, Nevada is really interesting to me because I think Nevada has – has proven more than Dayton has this year. And, you know, Dayton has Deron Holmes, who I think is a phenomenal basketball player. Mm -hmm. He kind of flirted with the transfer portal last year. He would have been a top five guy in the transfer portal, but I think Nevada just has too much here. And if we both pick Nevada, that will actually be two 10 seeds over sevens at this point so far. I Nevada's been a weird team this year. Uh, They've been super streaky. Um, They've, I think they've lost all their games within like two two different like six day periods or something like that. Like they either win a bunch in a row or they lose every game for a week uh, or two. And so I like Nevada. I think they're they're a pretty good team. Dayton, I was really high on midway through the season. They kind of stumbled a little bit as teams started oh, figuring off. out how to play them. So uh, I do agree. Deron Holmes is great. Uh, they have they have a good backcourt. I like Anthony Grant uh, for Dayton as a, as a coach, but. Um, I think Nevada gets the job done here. Yeah, we'll go Nevada, and we'll go and take Arizona as well. I don't think yeah. we have to talk about it too much. And frankly, he, I don't know. I don't know anything about Long Beach State. Well, the, <laughs> so. the Long Beach State might have the best story in the tournament. Their coach got fired at the beginning of the, uh, the conference yep. tournament, and they said, "Hey, you can you can stay on to coach uh, during the tournament," and he, he winds up winning the thing. So. Uh, literally a dead man walking and, uh, but yes, Arizona is going to be, <laughs> that's like when you have like a politician that's dead and still wins the election. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, North Carolina, Mississippi state. I think this one's interesting, but I, I still lean North Carolina here. Yeah. But I think RJ, it could be interesting. RJ Davis, Amanda Baycott, um, uh, you know, obviously they've been there, done that two years ago, granted, but, uh, I, I think they figured out how to play together. Cormac Ryan. Yeah. I, I do think they're – I think that's a weak – I mentioned this talking about the 8-9. I think it's a weak-ish 8-9 matchup. Uh, I think North Carolina is too much for Mississippi State. Then you got Alabama Grand Canyon. is interesting to me. I think that this is a coin flip game, which sounds bonkers, but I think it's a coin flip. I, I think it's Alabama. Um, I'm fine with that. <laughs> I think it's Alabama. I I like Alabama to to go to the Sweet 16. I I like them to beat either St. Mary's or Grand Canyon, uh, whoever comes out of that game, which is usually what I look for in a bracket. Like if I'm going to pick yeah. a pretty big upset, I want to find one where I'm, I'm pretty confident in the team that are going to play next. Um, I, I'm again everything I said about Grand Canyon earlier, but I, I think Alabama's too good as long as they don't have one of their like two for 28 from three nights. Yeah, and it's just one of those things where if Alabama lets Grand Canyon stick around, then it's gonna get it's gonna get iffy. And like I know that was great basketball wisdom there. If you let an underdog stick around, but but no, now you have New Mexico and you have Baylor. Um, I, I think Baylor's pretty daggum good. And, and the reason I say that is, you know, I've watched them play five or six times, but I go back to the first game of the season. You know, yeah. I think it was played on an aircraft carrier or something like that, but. It was Baylor Auburn, and Baylor got it done. And Baylor has, you know, I don't think they give they gave a crap about the Big Twelve tournament. I really don't think they did. I think, and Mitch, you can attest to this. There's been plenty of times in your college basketball career that, hey man, like we don't give a crap. Let's get to spring break. And <laughs> you know, it's not like Baylor was going to spring break, but I think at the same time it was like, do we really want to go to war for another 120 minutes against yeah. these guys? Like, let's just. You know, and you saw Kansas do it. Like Kansas said, yeah. "Hey, we're going to sit guys out." I'm going to push Baylor forward here. Agreed. Um, Nevada, Arizona, Arizona is a weird team to me because they have some quad three losses, they have some quad two losses, and Nevada is a much better team than those teams that they have lost to. I just wonder if Tommy Lloyd is just going to say, "We ain't doing it." <laughs> Get you know, put put your put your boots on. Let's go to war. I I honestly think Arizona kind of got bored in conference season. I think uh, they kind of 
they got they walked through the motions a little bit. They were the most talented team. If they lose when they would lose a game, they would usually turn around and, and win pretty handily, uh, kind of kick them back into gear. I, I don't think they have a ton of trouble with Nevada. I think they they get to the Sweet 16 pretty handily, uh, even if they play a C plus game um, uh, against N- Nevada. I think I think they're they're too talented um, and, and really too athletic um, for Nevada's guards to to go anywhere with that. I'm right there with you. I'm I'm pushing Arizona through. So we got North Carolina, Alabama, and. Like, I think North Carolina's defense will travel. Well, I know North Carolina's defense will travel better than Alabama's. But, but this is where a number one seed could go down because if Alabama gets hot and North Carolina just decides to let RJ Davis try and win the game for them and they get away from Harrison Ingram, they get away from Mondo Baycott. Elliot Cald- Caldell does Caldell. I think it's how you say Caldell, it. Yep. Caldell. Like this might be the moment when the point guard matchup between Mark Sears and Elliot is too much. If, if I'm picking this and I'm picking this as like giving advice to people filling out their bracket, I think this is where you might, you might take Alabama. Yeah. I don't disagree there. The other, the other point, for Alabama is is North Carolina doesn't really play well from behind. They're not really a truly like a fill it up. They're, they're much better playing from ahead. Um, whereas Alabama doesn't really matter where they're playing from. <laughs> they have the spurt ability to catch up 15 yeah. points in a, you know, a matter of, you know, three I'm minutes. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. So I agree that this would be, if this were to become a matchup, um, Alabama, like it, if you're picking a bracket, like, and you go game by game, you're like, Alabama can absolutely win every game. The problem with Alabama, and we saw it, we've seen it with NATO's led teams, is it really, it truly is, if they have a little bit of an off night, they're done because they can absolutely shoot themselves out of a game. That being said, yeah. I think North Carolina is extremely reliant on RJ Davis, and they're, you know, Alabama can throw some guys at it to, to try and stop them. I know Alabama hasn't really stopped a nosebleed this year, but um, <laughs> I I am okay picking Alabama here. So I'm actually, you know, I listened to everything you just said, and I think I'm going to take North Carolina. And, <laughs> but, but no, but here's the reason, and we're going to get – I'm going to take North Carolina here, but when you get to this point in your bracket and you have North Carolina, Alabama, Baylor, Arizona – like this is where you win a bracket by picking it right, mm-hmm. because any of these four teams could go to the final four. Yeah, and if you pick it wrong, you know I don't see. Let's just go through it. I don't see Mississippi State, Michigan State, St. Mary's, Grand Canyon, Charleston, Clemson, New Mexico, Colgate, Dayton, Nevada, getting picked to go to a final four. I so. Agree. You have a 25% chance if you get this far, and I could be wrong, that yeah, maybe there's an upset. But I just think that North Carolina has been the better team throughout the season than Alabama. They're pretty close in the metrics. And I think that if I'm having to make a gamble, which is what a, a bracket is, is a gamble, I think you take North Carolina because Alabama hasn't put it together all season long. And now you get to Bar- Baylor, Arizona, and – this would be one of the games that I think would be the most fun of the entire season because you have Baylor who went, was it double overtime or overtime against Houston? Mm-hmm. And one of the more fun games I've seen, granted that game was at Baylor. You have Arizona who's been kind of hit or miss. Like Baylor ain't scared of Arizona. Arizona ain't scared of Baylor. <laughs> and it's uh that'd be a wild night. I yeah, I probably lean Arizona here for a lot of the reasons I I said I like them earlier. Um they're extremely talented. I think Tommy Lloyd this is the year for him to to make a statement that he's not, you know, one of the most non-talked about factors of last year's tournament is Arizona lost to Princeton. They got bailed out by Purdue losing <laughs> to Fairleigh Dickinson. Yeah. But Arizona was I, I think like the the fifth highest betting favorite to win it all last year. Uh, yeah. And they go out to Princeton in the first round in, in disgusting fashion. I think they'll be ready to play. If they get to the second weekend, um, 
I like their chances against anyone from that quadrant. Uh, you know, Baylor's the best team from that quadrant, but you think of a Clemson, a New Mexico, Colgate's not going to get there. Um, I think any of those three teams, I like Arizona against. Um, I like Arizona to make a run. Um, and I think this is the year Tommy Lloyd kind of really steps on the gas and gets everyone there. And again, these players that have done it, a la Caleb Bluff. <laughs> Well, it's funny because I'm pretty sure that I heard this stat the other day. But if Arizona had won the Pac-12 championship and then also got to the Sweet 16, Tommy Lloyd would have the most wins by a head coach in their first three seasons of all time. Like the fastest to get to something or the most wins. So I'm okay with that. I'm going to take Arizona. And, you know, I know that, you know, we got half a bracket to get to in the final four. But I think everything you said makes sense to me. And I think I might take Arizona over North Carolina as well. I, I agree with that. Um, I like, again, I, I mentioned this. I like Arizona to make a run. We've talked about North Carolina. I think they're a little bit too reliant. But you want to talk storylines, Caleb Love going up against R.J. Davis and his former team that he went to the <laughs> national title with, that'd be something. Uh, and I, that's a, part of the reason why I like this matchup and what, like getting into it because the basketball fan of me would love to see that. Uh, for a trip to go to the final four, but I I do like Arizona over North Carolina. I agree with you. And I think that if you look at all the preseason metrics, if you look at, you know, the last three years, like we just talked about Arizona still probably has more talent than North Carolina top to bottom. Oh yeah. So I like Arizona. So we got two teams in our final four. Uh, We got UConn and Arizona matching up and we're not going to pick this game until we get through the other side of the bracket. So Phil, If you don't mind, hit us up with a word from our sponsors and we'll get to the other side. I said, oh, Lord Jesus, it's a fire. Ain't nobody got time for that. Emergencies and accidents happen. When you're in the middle of a fire or water event, all you want is for things to return to normal as soon as possible. Resto Pros of the Midlands is with you. RestoProsMidlandsSC.com. Open 24-7 when you need them. Quality that is guaranteed. Down here in the South, we don't always see eye to eye. While our taste in college football teams, or what sauce, if any, goes best on a rack of ribs, or what to mix with our Dixie vodka might be up for debate, we can all agree there's nothing better than a Southern tailgate. And like our favorite college teams, our ingredients come from small towns and big cities. They're grown in Southern soil, are crafted by Southern hands, and proudly represent the South in our backyard and beyond. So raise a glass of Dixie Southern Vodka to celebrate being made in America and raised in the South. Oh, man, the building is on fire. During and after natural disasters or accidents, there can be a heavy loss to property. Resto Pros of the Midlands is here to help. Open 24-7. Call them when you need them. 803-493-0170. RestoProsMidlandsSC.com. Quality that is guaranteed. So Craig has changed his his bracket. Now he has Iowa State winning it all, and he says he's going to change it ten more times. Well, Craig, I hate to tell you this, but we're um, you know literally only halfway through the bracket. So um, appreciate you guys sticking with us. I know this is a longer episode, um, but we wanted to make sure we did it right, and I wanted to get the best guy I knew in here to talk talk this through with me. So as we get over to the South region, we got Houston against Longwood. And Mitch, I know you've played against Longwood once or twice. What's your take on this one? Uh, yeah, Houston. Uh, Houston by a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so we are we are advancing Houston. Uh, Nebraska, Texas A&M is interesting. I think Nebraska is a really good team. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that Texas A&M has a, has a gaudy quad one record. Um, they've gone through, you know, what some would call the gauntlet of the SEC. I don't know if Mitch would, but the gauntlet of the SEC, and they've they've got some big wins. 
um, you know, none bigger than that win over Kentucky um, over the weekend. And Mitch, did you, did you get to watch that game? What, what I did, yeah. Yeah. It's just one of those things. Kentucky can be, and we'll get to Kentucky too, uh, they have those kind of games where they just come out so flat. And because they their defense isn't great, when you get a super guard-heavy team and you have guards like Taylor and Bradford that can – can really fill it up and start to hit shots. Um, that was the best I've probably seen Texas A&M play in two years. So, um, and yeah. it's funny you, it, that seems to happen against Kentucky a lot. <laughs> but I, I, I agree with you. I think Nebraska is great. I have a, a love for Nebraska because I, I, I think Tomanaga is one of the most electric players in college basketball. Uh, even though he plays, he might be a worse defender than I was. Um, they hide him so well on the defensive end of the, end of the court, but um, I think Nebraska is super solid, uh, you know, up and down. So I would probably take them over a And M here. I like Nebraska. Uh, I do. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Yeah. So I'm gonna go Nebraska. Now this one is super interesting. So Wisconsin, and you know, it's funny. Um, my brother also played college basketball, and he was in our group chat that he was like. Is Wisconsin a tournament team? And we're like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Tom, <laughs> they're they're a tournament team. <laughs> but Wisconsin had like a almost a tale of two seasons. They they started the first half of the season and they they played really really well. They racked up so many quad one games that it was kind of weird to look at their resume halfway through the season when they went on like a five or six game losing streak and then you know they lost to Illinois in the championship of the the big 10, but they also took down mighty Purdue, which I kind of had a feeling that was going to happen. Cause I thought Wisconsin played Purdue pretty good two times. Mm-hmm. And I know that whole saying it's hard to beat a team three times in a year. I don't subscribe to that at all. I also don't subscribe to the fact that playing four games or five games and five or four days is really going to impact you. And actually my brother had a good point with that. And I don't know if you were in that group chat, Mitch, but he said, kids nowadays have grown up playing AAU where they play three games in a day. Like yep. the, and, and, and the, and this has even changed because you've been out of, out of the game and you still play, but you've been out of the game for 10 years now, give or take. And like sports medicine, the recovery is so crazy that, you know, I don't want to go on a tangent about, you know, four games in four days or five games in five days, but you know, I think James Madison, they, they, they beat Michigan state as you alluded to earlier in the episode. Like James Madison ain't scared and they haven't lost a lot this year. And Wisconsin plays a style of play that I think could give them problems and probably still leaning Wisconsin. I'd agree with that. Uh, James Madison is extremely well coached. Mark Byington is the coach there. Uh, he's been on tournament teams. He's been on the staff at Wofford uh, a couple of times. It's made tournament runs. Um, but I, I would agree with you on the Wisconsin front. You know, that, I think they got ranked as high as like six at some point. Fifth they were up there. Some, some point yeah. early in the season, they hit that kind of conference lull that some teams uh, get. They had a couple, you know, minor injuries here and there. Um, but I like Wisconsin, and I've said this probably 10 times already, but when you have a guy that is the best player on the court by far in A.J. Store, it's going to help you, especially against teams that aren't as talented as you. Um you know, the Chucky Hepper and AJ store. I just think even if this is a close game, which I do think it'll be, um, and this will be an extremely trendy 12, five game for, for a lot of people. I like Wisconsin here. Yeah. It's weird. You know, Mitch, I kind of want to talk about this for a second. You know, you talk about like that conference lull that you kind of run into and, you know, a lot of people I talk to don't understand it. And like, I'm not someone that's ever done it, but I mean, Mitch, you played scout team in practice for a number of years. Like, Once you get film and you play a team a second time, mm-hmm. you've seen them play against teams that you've played against. And I love this because conference is different than NCAA tournament. When you get yeah. into a tournament, like, you can see how teams have been effective, but you haven't played against them yet. You don't know what's going to work for you. Yeah, I think, I mean, a perfect example is just last year. UConn didn't lose us or didn't not win a game by more than 10 points at the entire non-conference. They just lost games in the Big East. And especially in these larger conferences where you have these coaches and these teams that have played the same style uh, in the scouting report, you know, while the players change, the 
the scouting report is so detailed and they're so ready for what's coming uh, that it's minor changes here and there. Uh, and again, once you get to playing the team for the second time or even, you know, a third time in a conference tournament game, you you know what everyone's doing, um, you know, year over year, too, especially with these same coaches. So that that is a real thing. And why I don't take as much stock into it as, you know, if a team loses three or four, uh, that is typically pretty talented, that has a bunch of good wins in the non-con, um, like Wisconsin does. I, I think they're they're better than a five seed, uh, but I think they're they're properly seeded, if that makes sense. That, that makes perfect sense. But like one of the funny things that I remember is like playing a team the second time. And, you know, I've seen a lot of I've been around a lot of college teams, but like the scout team is just as beneficial as the coach because you are screaming from the end of the bench what this guy is going to do. And I mean, I remember, you know, nobody wanted to go into certain corners <laughs> when, <laughs> when you were playing against you know, a team that you've already played that year. So I think that like Wisconsin is a perfect example, like in this James Madison team, like where it's going to be a trendy upset pick. The fact that Wisconsin just remember they're better. They are Mm -hmm. better than James Madison one through 12, like literally one through 12. They're better. It would take, you know, a Purdue style collapse where like last year, a Virginia style collapse for Wisconsin to lose. So Go ahead and pick James Madison because I just screwed over the Badgers <laughs> with everything I just said. Uh, Duke Vermont's interesting to me. Um, Mitch knows that you know. Growing up, I have favored Duke, um, South Carolina more, but I favored Duke. Uh, I'm sick of this Duke team. I've watched every game they played this year. I'm sick of Kyle Filipowski. I'm sick of all of them. Um, I think they have good talent, but. I will predict Vermont to win because I don't want to see this Duke team play another game. <laughs> I'm going to, even though I, I understand that. And I think uh, now you are, are starting to come to the light of America <laughs> and hating Duke. Uh, this is uh, the Vermont and Colgate to me this year are the exact same team in everyone knows them. Cause they always go to the tournament, but these are yeah. actually like the worst versions of Vermont and Colgate in years. Yeah. Absolutely. that have actually made the tournament. Yeah. Um, so if this were Vermont from two years ago or Colgate from three years ago, I, I'd maybe be picking them, but th- they're just not nearly as good as they have been. So I I think we put the put the bias aside, and I agree. The Every time Duke loses early, it's hilarious. I love it. I do not like Duke, <laughs> but I think they do beat Vermont. <laughs> yeah, and, and one thing about Vermont really quickly is they do play a deliberate pace, very similar mm-hmm. to South Carolina. Um, so I'm going to pick Duke to win this game, but I'm probably going to pick Wisconsin here in a little bit. Um, (laughs) so Texas tech NC state is really interesting to me. I don't think Texas tech is that good. I mean, remember when they went to the final four, it's a different coach than it is Mm -hmm. now, but Grant McCasland is a hell of a coach, really good coach. Um, NC state, I think overachieved and everything I said about winning five games in five days, I thought it was interesting that NC State did not have to have, go to a playing game. And I go back to what I said earlier. You know, I don't think 16 seeds that, you know, win their conference tournament should have to play a playing game. But I do think a team like NC State should have to have a playing game. And the selection committee was weird this year because they made all the 10 seeds playing games. And that's traditionally not how it works. Yeah. I think uh, one point on that, the, I, I, it is weird to see 10 seeds on it, but I think so many bids got stolen to where these automatic yeah. qualifiers are, you know, 13, 14 seeds instead of like, you know, 10, uh, 12s that you see in the past that it, it actually kind of, and again, like a Vermont, those types of teams that kind of bumped that play in game down yeah. because you kind of had to, it was, it was a weird year with that. But at one point on Texas tech too, this is not the Texas tech from a couple of years ago. You mentioned nope. that it is a completely different team. You think Texas tech, like, Super deliberate, walk the ball up the court, play tough defense. Not this year, and not with not with Grant at the helm. Um, I think Texas Tech wins this game. I think NC State played a had a great run. Obviously, DJ Burns, electric, big South legend that Winthrop. <laughs> uh, but he, uh, I, I just don't see it. I think Texas Tech has almost run, might run him out. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm there with you. Yeah, I, I just don't see it, and. 
I don't think it'll much matter because we can move on to the next game. Uh, yeah, we're <laughs> going to take Kentucky round. against Oakland. But, you know, one of my thoughts is, like, every time I see DJ Burns, I'm like, how can you keep letting him get away with it? <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Gosh. Um, so Florida is in a weird spot right now. They obviously lost Micah. He had one of the most gruesome injuries I've ever seen on a basketball court. Prayers up to him. But Boise State, Colorado, like I'm just telling you right now, both these teams should have been a seven seed or an eight seed. Them as a playing game is is tough to see. I'm I'm probably just gonna take the winner of that game over Florida, which is crazy. I don't hate that one bit. Uh Florida, Florida's a Florida's a weird team this year. You mentioned that. The one thing, you know, you hate to see injuries. Uh, I do think Florida in the front court has the depth to withstand an injury like yeah. that uh, because, you know, they, they have they have plenty of guys um, on the, in the front court that can handle that. But your point, Boise State and Colorado are monsters. on The, the fact that Boise State is in the play-in game as a 10 seed is, is, why, is criminal. Like, there's <laughs> – like, they were – they were mad to see that. Like, I don't know if you saw the reaction shot. Yeah, they, they, the they looked like a funeral. Like, what are we go? Like, what is happening? And then Colorado to be a 10 seed is crazy too. They didn't have their lottery pick for 15 games this year. That really hurt them. Uh, they have a and their lottery pick isn't even their best player on the in the college game. Like KJ Simpson yeah. too. So uh, Colorado is a, is a, is an extremely dangerous team. Um, I this I have no problem picking them either of those teams over Florida. Boise State is great. Colorado is really good. I think Colorado is draw for to, Florida. Yeah, it's a really tough draw for Florida. And you know, to get to the SEC championship game, have that injury that I don't care who you are. Like it shook me. It's going to mm-hmm. shake other people. Um, you know, Florida showed some fight, but they really couldn't get past Auburn. Auburn was just too deep. But Colorado, in my mind. If you just say like your top three versus my top three, I think Colorado has the three players that are really daggum good. Um, now Florida is deep, but you know I'm I'm talking up Colorado right now, which means Boise State's going to win. But I just think that you know we're about to pick our third ten seed over a seven seed, and and, and we just talked about why are ten seeds getting playing games. But, yeah. Um, but yeah. So Marquette over Western Kentucky. I think. I think they're going to hold Tyler Colick out one more game. Mm-hmm. I, I. I think that's just smart. But I don't think they're going to have an issue there. So then yeah. you go to Houston, Nebraska. Houston. Yeah, I, I mean. We have to... No, 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 no. Like I've been telling everybody all year. <laughs> like Houston, Houston, Houston is the best defense I've ever seen. Yeah, and you know, rattles me a little bit that Iowa State game, but. Take I, that Iowa State game out of it, and they're pretty much on Houston's level when you think of val- like talent to, uh, of roster. But every team that Houston has played that is slightly below them in talent level, they have just choked out, and it's not even it's not been fun. It hasn't been fun to watch. And I'm sure <laughs> it hasn't been fun to play against. But that is what they do, and I think they do that to either Nebraska or Texas A&M. But they definitely are going to do that to Nebraska. Yeah, I mean, I I remember I think it was Kansas State's coach, and he was just like, "That's the best defense I've ever seen," and I've been doing this thirty years. Like <laughs> I've never seen a better defense, and like that that stuck with me. And it wasn't like they got beat by like thirty points; they they lost by like fifteen. Mm-hmm. So I mean, they they were trying; <laughs> they just couldn't do anything. Yeah, and Houston so, yeah. has. And typically when you t- see a team that has such a great defense, you're always, well, well, but can their offense handle it? And while their offense doesn't light up any charts, I mean, they have two great guards that can go get you a bucket at any point in the game too, uh, and shed and crier. So, I, yeah, I, I like using a lot there. So we got Wisconsin-Duke here. I'll let you do the analysis here. I'm going to pick Wisconsin, but I can be talked into Duke. Duke still is a top eight metric team in the country. So, like, they're just annoying. I will allow you to pick Wisconsin here. We will get revenge uh, from what was that, the 2016 national 2015, title game? Yeah, 2015. Tyus Jones hit it. Yeah, uh, when when uh, when Coach K paid off the refs uh, at halftime <laughs> against Frank Kaminsky and the boys. So uh, Lamont Paris too. He was an assistant coach on that staff. <laughs> So I, I again I like Wisconsin. I, I think this would be a great this is a great matchup. I think that from all levels of the, of the court, 
Um, you know, Wisconsin has a really good big guy, Stephen Corral, to match up with Filipowski. Uh, I think both guards, uh, Store and Hepburn, uh, against McCain and Roach, uh, I think are really good uh, matchups uh, across the board. But I am I'm okay taking Wisconsin. Oh no, it's the it's the easiest pick of the entire <laughs> bracket for me. Um, so Texas Tech, Kentucky, like you said, I don't know if it really matters here. We're gonna. I, th- I think that Kentucky. Look, John Calipari for years has hung his hat on the defensive end of the court, and they've had good offensive players and maybe two or three a year. But now he has a ridiculous offense, and for my money, just my money here, Kentucky has the most NBA players of any team in college basketball. I I don't think Texas Tech can stand up to them, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have to take Kentucky here. Agreed. And again, what we just talked about with Texas Tech, I mean, they, they like to get up and down now. You know, who else likes to get up and down and yeah. does it way better than them? Kentucky. Exactly. And then you go to um, Boise State, Colorado, or Marquette. This is where I think you see that 10 seed make the make the Sweet 16. Yeah, this I, I like either Marquette. one. I'm fine with it. <laughs> I like Marquette uh, the whole year um, in in. It, the the Tyler Kolick injury worries me. Um, the fact that it was supposed to be one or two games, I know, but everyone's saying precautionary reasons. They rely so, much, and I know they won a couple big Big East uh, games, got all the way to the final against UConn. Um, that being said, he is the engine that drives that Marquette Marquette train, and if they don't have him, that is a scary. Uh, same thing, scary for Florida. Either one of those teams. Uh, especially when you think about the guards from Colorado. Uh, I, I'd have no problem picking the upset here. I also have no problem picking up Marquette here, but I'm okay with the upset. I'm going to take the upset because that's one elbow away from re reaggravating that injury. Mm-hmm. It's one knee when someone jumps into you and you're trying to take a charge or you're jumping to somebody else. Um, I'm, I'm going to take it. Does- and even if he does play, is he is he going to be right? Is he going to be the same guy that won Big East Player of the Year last year? Like, I, I'm not sure. I, he, I'm sure he's going to play, but how effective is he going to be? Uh, and that's always a weird thing to have when you have a guy that you can't keep out of the game, but maybe it hurts you a little bit more than than you would think, especially when you get up against guys like KJ Simpson on Colorado or that that are really going to challenge you. And it's a, it's an absolute hedge bet that Mitchell and I are making right now. <laughs> like this is a hedge. <laughs> like, but one stat I did hear about um, Shaka Smart is I don't think he's made a Sweet Sixteen since his Final Four run. Nope. So there's something else to be said about that. Um, you got Houston, Wisconsin, and I know that Houston has an injury that we probably need to talk about at this point. Um, a shin injury that happened in the Big Twelve Championship. I don't care. I mean. Houston is going to suffocate Wisconsin, like yep. absolutely suffocate them. So I'm going to move Houston forward. Then you got Kentucky versus the winner of the Boise State Colorado game. At this point, Kentucky has the most NBA players in the country. We're going to move Kentucky forward. I think that Mitchell is fine with that. Yep. So now you got Houston and Kentucky. And if you want to talk about two teams that are just going to grind against each other for the entire game, two styles of play. Give me Houston. I'm sorry. Give me Houston. <laughs> I'm okay with that. I, in probably my personal bracket, I'll probably take Kentucky. I love this Kentucky team. I don't love Kentucky for anyone out there. Uh, I just, I love the roster they have. Uh, yeah. You know, Reeves, Reeves being kind of the steady, steady veteran and then Dillingham and, and Reed, uh, Reed Shepard are, are just incredible. Um, they almost have too much talent to where Cal hasn't still after 30 games, hasn't figured out the rotations um, <laughs> that I think make the most sense. Um, but this is one where I just think if Kentucky can get, can make a couple shots and force Houston to play a little bit at a pace, um, they, it would be a very difficult game for, for Houston to keep up with uh, the, the flip side of that in taking Houston is they literally faced an Alabama team last year that did similar things to what Kentucky does this year and yeah. they suffocated them. Um, so I'm okay either way here. Uh, again, elite eight, this is really a coin flip, but I like, I like both of these teams. 
personally probably take Kentucky, but I have no problem putting Houston in. Yeah, and and remember, it's hard to get to a Final Four. Like me and Mitch are talking about this right now. Like it's easy, and you know, there's oh yeah, well Houston could do it, Kentucky could do it. Like <laughs> they they might lose in the first round. <laughs> like we don't know. Yeah. Um. You know, for me, I think that Kentucky just has too many young players that haven't been here before. You know, they do have a couple other players that you know they've been with the program. I think Antonio Reeves is the only person that's been on the team for two straight years. Something crazy like that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I'll lean on Mitch here because this is a Gamecock show and can and South Carolina beat Kentucky by 17. So we'll we'll take Kentucky here. Um, but yeah, it, it'll be a very interesting, very interesting game that I would love to see because it's gonna be NBA talent versus college players that yeah. just know what they're doing. Um, so Mitch, we we've we've made it to our final region um and guys i appreciate everyone for for sticking with us you know this long but we wanted to make sure that we gave you the definitive college basketball NCAA tournament bracket show and i feel like we've we've lived up to it um purdue they're not going to do it two years in a row are they mitch Uh, it it simply can't they simply can't (laughs) i can't see it uh it would be very funny if it happened it would be hilarious it'd be very good I play basketball with two diehard Purdue fans, uh, but I I can't I I cannot see it happening in two years in a row. How did you find two diehard Purdue fans in Austin, Texas? <laughs> basketball, the great the great equalizer. If you play basketball, that's why that's where I meet you. There you go, there you go. All right, so Utah State TCU. I'm be honest, Mitch. I'm gonna let you take this one. I don't know anything about TCU. I mean, I've kind of watched them play. The Big 12 was a slog this year. I mean, mm-hmm. they they had some wins, but at the same time, Jamie Dixon's been there before. He's getting a little older now, which nothing nothing wrong with age. Um, with age comes wisdom. But Utah State, I think, was underseeded as an eight seed. I, I, I can't simply can't fathom why they're an eight seed. It makes no sense to me. They're an awesome team. I'm going to pick Utah State here. I think TCU is good. Emmanuel Miller, really good. Uh, Utah State has one of the best names in college basketball. Great Osibor is their big yeah. guy. <laughs> uh, He's like Jokic. They, yeah, they have a a really good team. Um, I, I'd pick Utah State. TCU, you know, they lost 12 games. They played in the Big 12, tough conference, but away from home, they weren't they weren't very good, and they, they feasted on some of the bad teams they played early. Um, I, I like Utah State here, and again, well, criminally think- underseeded. Yeah, it's crazy. I think Jamie Dixon is going to set a record for most eight, nine games coach <laughs> in his career every year, eight or nine seed. Yeah. Uh, Gonzaga McNeese is really interesting to me, and it's a 12 5. I, I personally don't know how Gonzaga was seeded as a five seed. I mean, for a team that two weeks ago was out of the tournament <laughs> to be a five seed, um, you know, good on you, Mark Few. Good on you, Tom Izzo. You got mm-hmm. the track record. Um, but this is where I could see McNeese winning just because it's Will Wade. Like yeah. it's not some scrub. And yeah. I guarantee you, Will Wade has cheated this entire <laughs> season. He has refs in his back pocket and Gonzaga, you know, for better or for worse, you know, they made the NCAA tournament national championship in 2017, but you know, Gonzaga has underperformed in the NCAA tournament. I, I don't know if it matters. I think Purdue would take care of the winner of this game. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think this is a spot where you can take McNeese and maybe turn your bracket upside down. I am going to actually fully disagree with you on this one. And for the first <laughs> time fine. on the show that I fully disagree, I actually love this McNeese team, another team that was a fantastic to bet on all year. Uh, they were an absolute wagon in their conference. They dominated everyone. They were just better than everyone in their conference. And McNeese is going to be a super trendy 12 over five. I, again, this is another one. I mentioned this with Charleston and Alabama. This is just not a good matchup for McNeese. They like to get out and run. They like to push it. They like to shoot threes. The problem is, is they – are playing Gonzaga, who does that better than stylistically better than anyone over the last decade. Yeah. And you saw what happened when Gonzaga went and played Kentucky, a team that likes to get up and, and down and run. At, and at was, Kentucky. At Kentucky. And that 
I don't think I'm going out on a limb here. Kentucky has more talent than McNeese <laughs> and Gonzaga. <laughs> beat Are you them. sure? <laughs> so I like Gonzaga here. Um, I, I, it's no indictment on McNeese. I would love to see Will Wade in the upstate uh, wearing orange and purple next year, uh, doing all the shady, <laughs> all the shady things possible. Uh, but I don't think this is a great matchup. Again, if they were playing, if McNeese was playing Wisconsin, I'd probably pick McNeese. Um, or if they were playing St. Mary's, I would 100% pick McNeese. I just don't think this is the five seed. That's a good matchup for them. I could be wrong. And again, Mark Few has not has not had a first round exit. So yeah, is this the year? No, this no, is- no. You 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 convinced me. You convinced me. I mean, you look back at Gonzaga's season and they lost to St. Mary's in conference play by like mm-hmm. two points. They lost by one point to like Portland State or something like that. But the the rest of their losses are understandable, and they yeah. were all three or four possession games. So I understand why Gonzaga is in the NCAA tournament. But as a five seed is absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> I don't disagree with you there. I think they, a six or a seven would have been fair for them. The other point I'll make on Gonzaga real quick and why I think it took them a little bit longer to figure things out this year. They were banking on a small forward transfer, Steel Venters, that is a really yeah. good basketball player, tore his ACL before the season even started. So I think it took them a little bit longer to figure out exactly who they were and who was going to step up. I think some of their younger guys have stepped up. Uh, as the season went on, um, Gonzaga is probably not a team I would want to see in the first couple rounds, just because they all Mark Few does is make Sweet Sixteens. Uh, <laughs> so that's that's my take on that. Well, I wanted Gonzaga to be an eight nine so badly. <laughs> like yeah. if I could have wished something into existence, it was Gonzaga on the eight nine eight nine line, only because they got screwed by Kentucky. <laughs> a couple years back yep. when Kentucky was an eight seed that went to the final four. Yep. Um, this next one right here, Kansas and Samford. Um, this is not your dad's Kansas team. No. This is not a traditional Bill Self Kansas team. Bill Self is usually deep with his roster. They're not deep this year. They might go six deep. Um, they have injuries to Hunter Dickinson. They have in- injuries to Kevin McCuller. Um, both those guys are potentially all Americans if fully healthy for an entire season. I do think they have a great point guard and I'm blanking mm-hmm. on his name. What's the kid's name? Uh, Dewan Mitch. Harris. Yeah. Dewan oh. Harris. Um, I will say this though. Um, fans of inside the Gamecocks. Um, if you're not subscribing, downloading, it is 11 to two every Monday through Friday. Uh, Mike Morgan is on that show a good bit. And Mitch, you you know who Mike Morgan is. He calls a lot of college basketball games, mm-hmm. uh, former um, basketball and baseball play-by-play guy at South Carolina. But he said that Sanford is really good. He's called their games. He's had at least one or two of them. This is that weird, weird situation where Kansas is not the Kansas of old, and they shouldn't be a four seed, by the way. But they are a four seed, and maybe Samford is good enough to figure out a way. I'm going to take Kansas, but I'm just saying circle this one on your brackets. I, I agree with that. I, I think take Kansas. The The cool thing about Samford is they play, They have a, a, a guy that was a very successful high school coach that made the Bucky. jump to – Yeah, they play buckyball, and that is full court press, shoot a bunch of threes. Um they laid a few eggs because it's very similar to teams that do that, where if they start missing a few shots and they get down, it gets ugly. Uh, yeah. But it this is all in Kansas. This is all about the health of Dickinson and McCuller. That's really the only thing that matters for them, because I don't even know if they have they have a like I don't think six through nine for Kansas could play on anyone else in the Big 12. Uh, I don't think they would even crack a rotation. So I I agree. I think Kansas wins this game. I do think they are able to handle the pressure and defensively stop Sanford. Uh, but I I am not high on this Kansas team whatsoever. No, not at all. Now we have the game of the hour. <laughs> the game of the two hours. <laughs> um, we have <laughs> South Carolina and Oregon. South Carolina, the sixth seed. Oregon, the 11th seed. Um we all know about South Carolina. They're very deliberate. They they don't out 
out-athlete you. They don't out-talent you, but they just beat you. And the times that they have lost is teams that honestly probably have more talent. I mean, even Clemson up on the upstate probably have more just raw talent than South Carolina does. Mm -hmm. Oregon, on the flip side, looks very similar to South Carolina in the computer metrics. They have Jermaine Cusinard, who was a former South Carolina Gamecock. Um, They have a really good um, big guy, the last name Dante. He's Dante. Yep. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those games where it's being played in Pittsburgh. That's a long haul from Oregon (laughs) to get there. I don't know how many Oregon fans are going to follow them. Maybe more because they won their conference tournament. I think that Mitch and I both agree that winning the Pac-12, Pac-2, whatever you want to call it now, is not that high on the achievement list of things that you know you hang your hat on. But I think South Carolina, as of right now, is like a one and a half point favorite. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, the betting market is concerned about South Carolina. I, I the lean betting, South the Car- betting. The betting market has been wrong on South Carolina all year. They have <laughs> they've been criminally undervalued. I've taken advantage of that. Um, they have been. I think they're one of the top like five or six teams against the spread. They've been awesome on the money line, especially when they've been underdogs. The, the concern with Oregon here is that they are far more talented than an, a, a typical 11 seed. They are another team that was not deep to start the year. They dealt with injuries. We're playing guys yep. that typically wouldn't be playing for them. Uh, they are healthy now, which is evident uh, of them winning, even though, you know, the you know Pac-10 tournament or whatever is not not the greatest. But they, they did win it, and they won it fairly convincingly, and especially beating a Colorado team that we talked about earlier that we love. Yeah. So, and it, again, and they, they, if, if South Carolina fans have not watched it, there is a white kid for Oregon that they are going to absolutely hate. Uh, Bigsby, <laughs> he is, he looks like he should go to Duke. Uh, he's, he can be very <laughs> hateful, but he's another really good player. You mentioned Cusinard uh, and Folly Dante. I, again, South Carolina, I've said this all year to South Carolina fans. I, South Carolina is great at winning basketball games. I do not think South Carolina is a great basketball team, but I do think they they have played so many grinded out close games uh, that I do like them to beat Oregon. Yeah, it's it's interesting to me for, you know, so Oregon beat UCLA by two points in the conference tournament. They beat Arizona, I think, by eight points, and they beat Colorado. It It's always tough for me in conference tournaments. I don't mm-hmm. know how I feel about them. Because, I mean, just point blank, I've been around college basketball teams that wanted to lose (laughs) the first game of the tournament for a multitude of reasons, but especially where they were in the country and Mm -hmm. what they could do that night because the coaches (laughs) would be pissed and the coaches would not be paying attention to them and the season was over. Um, And that's what Oregon was facing. I mean, you've seen a number of teams that have declined NIT opportunities because they felt like they got snubbed. Um, I don't know if Oregon makes the NCAA tournament without winning the Pac-10, Pac-12, Pac-2 conference tournament. I think it's going to be a tough game. I I don't Mm -hmm. think that, you know, this is a 12-point South Carolina win. I hope it is, but I don't know. Um, You know, Dana Altman has never lost in the first round of the NCAA tournament. That's Really good coach. Really good (laughs) coach. Yeah. Really good coach. I mean, been to a Final Four. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that if South Carolina wins this game, they absolutely earned it. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, as we look through the rest of, you know, this bracket going down the rest of the Midwest, I think that if South Carolina wins, they got the best win of any team at, you know, from here down, probably Mm -hmm. the hardest win. At this point in the season, I can't say South Carolina isn't going to win their opening game. So, I'm going to take South Carolina, but I don't I don't know if it's a slam dunk. And on the flip side, every South Carolina fan in the world, if I told you at the beginning of this season you were going to be a six seed in the NCAA tournament, you take it. Yep. And it's it's building blocks now. And South Carolina fans have been spoiled in football by Steve Spurrier. They've been spoiled in basketball with Frank Martin making that miracle Final Four run. And, you know, I don't know how far the Gamecocks will go, but I am going to pick them to win their their first matchup here. 
The next game, Creighton Akron. Um, Creighton's an interesting team. Um, we all saw what they did to Connecticut. Um, I don't think Connecticut ever expected to lose by 20 points. And, you know, my betting account did not predict them to lose by 20 points. Um, I, don't, I don't think Creighton's going to have a problem with Akron, but I do think it's important to know that Creighton is not deep. Um, and if they are not hot from three, um, it could be could be a difficult run there. Hey, Michael, Creighton. good to have you here. Um, well, sorry, Mitch. Uh, no, Michael, no. good to have you here. Yeah, we're going a little long tonight, but we're going through this entire bracket. So make sure that you rewatch this or re-listen to this because this is how you're going to win your your neighborhood bracket. But go ahead, go ahead, Mitch, with the Creighton Akron game. Yeah, Creighton. Uh, more so on Creighton. Uh, I, I don't think Akron's going to have any is or they're going to have any with any issue with Akron. They're they weren't the best team in the MAC this year. The the best team in in MAC lost uh, in the first round of their conference tournament. Um, Creighton has never really been deep, and it's never really mattered for them. Uh, they are a another controversial call away from going to the Final Four last year. They had San Diego State beat. Uh, Nimar brushes yeah brushes his elbow, and they call a foul. Uh, I I really like this Creighton team. McDermott's an unbelievable coach. I think he's you know a top five coach in the game. They have they they almost always have uh, a really like good first six and and they're they perfectly complement each other. They have another one, they can shoot it, but they're not as reliant on the three ball as as typical Creighton teams have been. Uh, Trey Alexander is is an NBA player. Uh, Baylor Shireman likes to get to the rim too. They have an awesome center. Um, so again, no problem with Akron. That's just more of a the depth issues don't concern me with Creighton. Another thing that doesn't concern me with Creighton with their depth issues is they just simply do not foul. They hardly yeah. ever are in foul trouble. I think they're one of the least uh, foul teams, and especially for a team that plays in the Big East, that's not easy to do. Uh, so they do a good job of, even though you know their guys play 35, 36 minutes a game, uh, it doesn't matter as much because they're rarely ever in foul trouble. Well, that's how they get to play 35, 36 <laughs> minutes a game. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this next one, Texas versus the winner of Colorado State and Virginia. Um, okay, here's your lock. Are you ready for your lock? Trent, if you're still here, take Colorado State with everything you own over Virginia because Virginia stinks. <laughs> they stink. If nothing else, just so America doesn't have to watch Virginia again. I mean, I think at one point over three games, they combined for 96 points in the last two weeks of the season. Um, I, uh, brutal, I'm one brutal, of the, brutal. I'm one of the sick people that took the over in Virginia NC State in the ACC championship game, and that bank three got me to overtime to get me an over 120, which is uh, over 120, low. y'all. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that, that's not good. Um, nope. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think Colorado State's going to advance over that game, and I think that's why. You know, I wanted to mention that because we're basically going to talk about Colorado State versus Texas. Yeah. Um, you know, Texas has that. Was it Abrams or Ar- Armand? Um, uh, Max Asmus, who was at yeah, Oral Roberts. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. He is, I think he's the all the current leading scorer in college basketball history, or not history, but like just current leading scorer yep. um, playing college basketball. I think he has most more threes than anybody else. He is so much fun to watch. Um, so if you get an opportunity, watch him. Um, is that what didn't he beat Oklahoma a couple years ago with, um, Trey young. He's been in college a while. So he was on the oral Roberts team that beat that Ohio state team, the 15 over two. Uh, and then that oral Roberts team did go to the sweet 16. I can't remember who they won in that, that second round. Um, but that was a really good team. Ace, Ace, I think went for like 38 or something against Ohio state at the game winner in overtime. Um, so he has been around for a while. I think this is I lost his a final lot year. of money, a lot of money on that game too. I chased Ohio State the entire day. Yep. Don't chase, it's a pillar. Um, but <laughs> I I live in Austin, Texas. I know a lot of Texas fans. Texas bothers me. This is not a good Texas team, but I I do think they advance at least one game here. I think they win. I just think what Colorado State does well, Texas does better than them. Um, I don't think it's a great matchup for for Colorado State. 
the other part of this, Dylan DeSue, um, has been in college and the other guy has been in college for forever. He carried Texas last year in the tournament. If you remember that, yeah. Texas made a, a, a good run to was the Elite Eight. Elite against, eight. And, and uh, then, yeah, their coach lost, got, got hired, yeah. Yeah, lost to Miami. Uh, so, and Dylan DeSue, I think, was averaging like 20-plus a game. Um, he's back healthy, which is why Texas has been playing a little bit better. Uh, Texas also has one of the most infuriating players in college basketball uh, to, to watch, Brock Cunningham. Um, so if I don't have to watch any more of him play basketball, I think he's like 27 years old. Uh, I'd be okay with Texas losing, but I think they they win the first game. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take Texas as well. I think that better for worse, we're going to see them play <laughs> um, the second, the second um, day. I guess, what is that? That's on – 21st whatever it's either friday it's gonna be saturday or sunday um but tennessee versus st peter's we all know st peter's they are near and dear to all of our hearts um the peacocks are a fun <laughs> team uh, i don't know how fun they are this year and honestly you know despite rick barnes and Blade tournament struggles um what mitch has said all night is when you have a guy named don connect on your team i ain't that worried about about st peter's so we're gonna advance yep. tennessee um, you got Purdue, Utah State, and I'm sorry, but Utah State has never seen anything like Zach Eady. <laughs> We're going to push Purdue through here. Gonzaga, Kansas is the fun matchup that we have right now. You have two Hall of Fame coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, obviously, Bill Self has won a national championship. Mark Few has not. Uh, look, man, I wanted to pick McNeese over Gonzaga just for the fun of the bracket. But if you're telling me right now that Kansas is half healthy with six guys and Gonzaga goes deep, you know what, man? I'm I'm thinking that Mark Few goes back to yet another Sweet 16. I I this I think it goes back to the point. I think this is an extremely vulnerable Kansas team. I think Gonzaga's figured that out. And again, I can't get the Gonzaga going uh, to Rupp Arena and beating Kentucky the way they did it um, out of my head. Um, and Kentucky to me is far more talented and better than Kansas is. And Kansas beat up. Um, I, I think Gonzaga matches up well. They go deeper. I think they can run them out if they need to. Uh, I like Gonzaga here. It would not shock me if Kansas goes to the Sweet 16, but I like Gonzaga in the Sweet 16 here. Yeah, it's weird because I think if if we advance Kansas and we talk about the next matchup against Purdue – then I might like Kansas over Purdue just because Kansas <laughs> is clearly healthy. <laughs> yeah. If, if that makes sense. Yeah. If that makes sense. But yeah, we're going to move Gonzaga forward. Now we have South Carolina Creighton. This is, you know, one of the teams that I put on the big spur that, you know, if you don't like playing Auburn, you don't want to play Creighton. Not because Creighton's as deep as Auburn, but when you look at their scoring efficiency, on offense and defense, they're pretty daggum close to Auburn. And Creighton isn't there hanging their hat on defense like they have in past years. But at the same time, you have a team that went to the Elite Eight versus a team that won eight games last year in South Carolina. And, you know, as much as I want to be a homer, I – and look, you know, if, if, if South Carolina plays Tennessee – to go to the Elite Eight, I'm going to pick South Carolina because they've <laughs> played them to a, to four points, you know, four point differential over two games, home and away. But this is one that I'm going to let Mitch pick. This is one, and I, I mentioned this uh, talking to some South Carolina fans earlier. I, I think Creighton's just an awful matchup for South Carolina. Uh, yeah. You mentioned it like the comp with Auburn. Uh, I just, it is tough to, to match up with a team that, you look across their top five, and it is a is a fantastic built roster. They have shooters everywhere. They have a big guy that you can't score at the rim at, which is what South Carolina does. If any of you have looked at the the charts of where South Carolina scores from, a lot of it is in the paint. And there's a seven two guy uh, talking. You know, Ryan Cockburner is just not going to let you score at the rim. So, I would say I like Creighton in this game. I think it's a bad matchup for South Carolina, but again, South Carolina grinds it out. Yeah, it, it's a it's a tough one because if Creighton doesn't foul, South Carolina has to make shots, and South mm -hmm. Carolina hasn't made shots lately. Um, so, if all the Gamecock fans that are still listening to this, you know, we're gonna push Creighton forward 
It sucks. I don't like doing it. <laughs> but um, Texas, Tennessee, I mean, it's another interesting matchup here. You have Rick Barnes going up against his former team. Uh, I think that Tennessee's better than Texas. I think they're more consistent than Texas. Yep. I'll probably, unless you have a disagreement, I'm going to push Tennessee past Texas. I agree. Dalton connects. So, so now you have you have Purdue, Gonzaga. Um, I I think that Purdue is better top to bottom. They played the toughest schedule in the country. They were the number one team in the country going to the tournament last year. They're 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 still really really good. I, I think that we can move Purdue forward. Yep. Now you got Creighton, Tennessee, and if if I liked South Carolina to beat Tennessee, I, I do like Creighton to beat Tennessee. Um, I think this is one of those matchups where like you talk about Dalton connect and I'm not the person that says if Dalton connect doesn't score 30, Tennessee loses because they have more talent than just Dalton connect. Mm -hmm. But I do like Creighton. I think that they're just so sneaky good. And I think they get to the elite eight. I, I, I agree with you there. I, I really like Dalton connect, but there are games where he, he can take them out of it. Uh, we've seen yeah, that happen absolutely before. against South Carolina uh, and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and Kentucky, the Kentucky game. I think he shot like 24 times or something, uh, you know, in Knoxville when Kentucky knocked him off. So uh, I like Creighton there. Uh, I like Creighton to get back to the elite eight and, and play Purdue. Well, it's, it's funny because like I say, like against South Carolina and you look at the stats and he had like 75 combined points over two games, but when South Carolina came back at home against Tennessee, it was because Dalton Connect was shooting and he wasn't making it and no one else was stepping <laughs> up and he opened the door. And then I think that, you know, when you look at this Tennessee team and you look at Creighton, I think Creighton has more ways to beat you than Tennessee does. And so yep. that's why, you know, I picked Creighton there. So now you have Purdue and Creighton to go to the Final Four. I think Purdue is too good. I think they're I think too they, deep. I think they exercise the demons. Uh, I think. A painter gets the monkey off his back and, and gets to the final four. I think this is a great matchup in a great region for Purdue when it came out. Yeah. That was one of the first things I saw. Um, whereas, you know, if you're looking for a place for Purdue to get tripped up, now granted, they've gotten tripped up by bad teams, really bad <laughs> low seeded teams. But if you're looking for actual teams, you know, to as you go through the bracket, I love their matchup against the rest of them, and they're a little more battle tested this year. And if you remember the last couple of years, they, they actually faltered pretty heavy down the stretch um, the last couple of years, even though they they had a great record and were you know one, two seeds. They didn't look great down the stretch. They've looked awesome down the stretch outside of, you know, them losing in overtime to Wisconsin. So uh, I'd like Purdue to go to the final four. So that takes us to our final four. We have UConn, Arizona. And I know where I'm leaning and I think you're leaning the same way. Yeah, I, I like UConn. I was going to say Arizona. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I don't want to go too much into the math here, but this final four of UConn and Arizona, Arizona's already shown the ability to lose to quad three teams. Miss. They haven't played the competition that UConn has played, even though the Big East only got three teams in the NCAA tournament. But when you're this dominant against so many different teams, I don't care who you are. We're going to move UConn forward. And then this is where it's really interesting with our final four of Kentucky and Purdue. And I'm going to let you take the wheel here for a second. And I'll, I'll so get us back on the road if we need to. I This would be a, a, an awesome uh, final four, but kind of from a macro level for the entire year watching this, I've had a very similar feeling about uh, Purdue and UConn that I had to Baylor and Gonzaga a couple of years ago, where I just felt like they were the two best teams all year. And it, and it wasn't particularly close. Granted, that year with Gonzaga and Baylor, I don't think it, Gonzaga hadn't lost a game. Maybe they lost one. Baylor lost like one COVID game. Yeah. But they they were routing teams. While they've each of these teams have lost like what two three games, I, I think they're on a collision course. It's less about Purdue versus Kentucky, more about how I felt the entire year about Purdue and UConn being the two best teams in the country and on a collision course. UConn, the storyline of defending a national title. Purdue, trying to exercise some demons, trying to get there. And this is trying really to pull up Virginia. Yeah, and really trying to 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 maximize their their window of this is probably it for their this immediate window with Edie uh, being done with college basketball. So 
that's that's my pick for that. But I'm open to to suggestions. Yeah, I mean, my thing right now is I think Purdue is too disciplined, and I've been saying it this entire time. Like, you can have a young team that can get to the Final Four. Mm -hmm. You can have a young team that gets to the national championship. I don't think that you can win as a young team in this transfer era, transfer portal, whatever you want to call it, you know, window of college basketball. And Purdue returned everybody. Mm -hmm. Kentucky returned one person. And Purdue has the two-time national player of the year. And, And one thing that, you know, say what you want, but, you know, me and Mitch and our side chats have been talking about this all year. I'll tell you one thing Purdue will do against any team they play, and that's shoot free throws. They will shoot 20 more free throws than anybody else. And, you know, some of that is the fact that it's really hard to guard someone that's seven foot four Mm -hmm. and you are going to rake his face. You're going to rake his arms. You're going to try and stop him and you're going to build up fouls. And Purdue has a great defense, top 20 in offense, top 20 in defense. Kentucky has a poorest defense. If you're looking for a team like Purdue that can, make their shots. And even if Kentucky gets up by 11 in this type of matchup, I don't think Purdue it's over. You know, mm-hmm. there are some teams where Kentucky gets up by 11. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go to sleep. Like there it's over, mm-hmm. but not against Purdue. So I'm going to take Purdue. You got Connecticut, you got Purdue for the national championship. And, you know, I try not to lean on narratives too much, even though the narratives are really fun to think about where you have a back-to-back national champion and a team that was the number one overall seed last year, lost in first round, lost to a 16 seed. I mean, but when you look at these two teams, I think Connecticut has more talent overall, you know, one through eight. But I think that Purdue has the best player in the country. And, you know, Donovan Klingon has been phenomenal since he came back from injury. Mm-hmm. but I could see him fouling out with 10 minutes to go in the game. Yep. So I don't like to say it, but I think Purdue. <laughs> I, this is one where I've, I've wrestled with this. Um, I am, this is truly one of those. If we see this will be a coin flip. I love UConn, but to the, to your point, I don't love UConn's front court depth. I know Samson Johnson is a good player, yeah. but anytime he, but he's small. And he's not going to, he's, you know, 6'10, maybe like 210 pounds or something. He's not going to be able to come in and spell with Edie. They're going to have to go to it. They would have to go to a double team. If Klingon can keep it out of there and keep out of foul trouble, I like that. But I, I've, I like the, the storyline of if you're a one seed and you lose to a 16 seed, you turn around and win the national title the next year. So I think we keep that streak going. Purdue, <laughs> Purdue wins it all, uh, <laughs> and maybe maybe teams, maybe coaches start playing chess instead of checkers, and and losing the 16 seeds just to get a national title. Maybe we see Mark Few do it uh, to get off the side. <laughs> well, that that's interesting. I don't know if, if I would prescribe that if I'm a doctor <laughs> for college basketball coaches. I think that you better be pretty secure in your job, otherwise you might get fired. <laughs> but. Yeah. But no, I, I I don't know. I, I had this sneaky feeling. I think it's hard to win two in a row. I think the pressure starts mounting, even though UConn is basically a new team from last year. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think at the end of the day, you have the two-time defending national player of the year, and and it's it's disgusting. Like it's disgusting <laughs> to pick Purdue. But you know, you go through this, and we've done that. We've done this. You know, we picked what sixty-seven games here. In an hour and 54 minutes, we've talked about every team. I think that UConn and Purdue have the least warts of mm-hmm. any team. And, you know, I'm a big fan of not winning your conference tournament. I don't know why. I just think that that's <laughs> like a bad omen. Purdue got to the championship game and didn't win it. So me and Mitch are going with Purdue. You guys fill your bracket out <laughs> the way you want to, um, you know, just – Hit me up. I'll give you um, Mitch's cell phone number if you want to reach out to him and you have questions. I, I will. I will send you his number. <laughs> but um, we'll see how we do. I'm gonna. I'm gonna write this down. We'll revisit it. We'll. Um, you know, at the end of this thing, I'll tell you how me and Mitch did. And you know, Mitch is game for it. I'd love to have him on the show this time next year. Yeah, absolutely. Always happy to do it again. Everything today was off the rip just because all I do is watch college <laughs> basketball. So. <laughs> That's uh, absolutely well. That's why I wanted you on here. I mean, (laughs) and 
you know, I don't know if we can do a gambling show or not. Like, I don't know if that's allowed, <laughs> but, um, but y'all, I appreciate y'all so much. Um, you know, I say this after at the end of every episode, but all of you give me the most valuable thing you have, which is your time. I can, I can never measure that. And I'm so thankful for this time I get to spend with all of y'all and the support you give me. Um, so thankful that the Gamecocks are in the NCAA tournament as well. And this has been so much fun. It's been a great ride. I'm glad we got Mitch on here. He he knows basketball even better than me, which is hard to believe. But um, everyone, enjoy your night. Enjoy Thursday. The Gamecocks will be playing at 4 o'clock in Pittsburgh. Um, they got Oregon coming up, and then hopefully a nice little run here, and, and we'll see what happens. But thank you all again so much. Um, we'll see you, see you next week. Have a good evening. See you all.